The praise of God is the number one thing. Worthiness of His name. Worthiness of the name of Jesus. And praise to Almighty God. That's our topic this morning as we turn in our Bibles to the 28th Psalm. If you would, open in your Bibles to Psalm 28. And we're going to stand to read verse 7 only of that psalm. Psalm 28 and verse 7. Psalm 28, verse 7, as we stand in honor of God's Word. This is one of the Psalms of David. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise Him. Father, we pray this morning that you will guide us in the proclamation, myself in the proclamation, all of us in the hearing of your word. Father, that we might come to the place in our life that in all ways, in all situations, with all our heart, we praise you for all you are. We love and praise you now and come to your word with humbleness, with recognition of its sacredness, and with great gratitude and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you see it? Thank you. We have this past week experienced what I thought was refreshing rain. Uh, Like many of you, my garden that I had to replant part of it earlier in the year because it was flooded out, but the rain stopped until we got a fairly decent little rain this week. I found that refreshing. I imagine that many of you did as well. Now you're going to have to mow your lawn, but it's worth it. But folks, when it comes to a refreshing rain, the refreshing rain of the praise of God, for the Christian, for the child of God, to be able to just come right down there and praise Almighty God, that is the number one most refreshing thing you'll ever do. David talks with us this morning about joyful praise for the God of strength. I want to talk to you briefly this morning on the topic of praise. The Bible says here in this one verse that joyful praise comes when we realize that God is our protector. You need a protector. Even you hairy leg, tough young men need a protector. You proud, self-sufficient people with plenty of money in the bank and your health's going good, but you need a protector. David was, as everyone knows, the king of Israel. David was the mightiest warrior of his day. David was someone who other people listened to very often with unquestioning confidence, and yet David said he knew who his protector was. When we realize that God is our protector, we realize the sacred beauty of praising that God who protects us. Are we willing to admit that we need a protector? I would submit to you that one of the things that's involved in coming to Jesus is admitting that you need a Savior, admitting that you need a protector, admitting that you're not sufficient in yourself and you're not adequate in yourself and it's okay not to be. Man, you need a protector. Some of you perhaps before you came to Jesus, struggled with admitting that you weren't all there was. That you weren't the captain of your own ship and you weren't necessarily going to be able to get your old life going and that everything wasn't going to go well. But folks, when you come to Almighty God as your protector, you realize your own insufficiency and you can celebrate with joy His all-sufficiency. We often hear folks say that Christians are just somebody that need a a giant Father in Heaven to protect them because they're weak. I say, hallelujah, praise God, you are correct. You won't get a bit of argument from me. Hey, we're all in. Folks, if you're here this morning and you are a born-again Christian, you are all in. You, you have said, God, you are Savior, you are Protector, and I need you. Not only now, but for eternity. Are you all in? 
I want to say to you this morning that when you come to Jesus, you're all in. And you're recognizing that God is your protector. In fact, this translates the word here, Ezra, from which we get the prophet's name. When they came back from captivity under the leadership of Ezra, they came back as a people of God, broken, but now realizing their utter dependence on Almighty God in Him alone. From that day forth in the history of Israel, there was never any more problem with idolatry. There were never any rivals for the sole leadership and protectorship of Almighty God. It carries the idea, this word does, to come to the rescue. Have you ever gotten to be rescued? Have you ever gotten to be the rescuer? I have a humorous story from when our children were little. If you'll suffer me just for a moment, uh, my wife and our two daughters, when they're all little, not her, she was grown, <laughs> were stranded on a bridge and she somehow bummed a cell phone. She didn't have one with her and she called me and said, uh, hey, I'm, I think they were out of gas or the fuel filter was clogged up on the car. I wasn't getting gas. But if you gearheads, you'll just appreciate that. Whatever. And, but my son was with, there at home with me, and he was about this tall, and he was in his pajamas, and I said, we're going to go rescue Mama and Emily and Kylene. And he said, Daddy, do people normally rescue other people in their pajamas? And I said, Buddy, we, we do today. <laughs> now, but I've been rescued. I've been rescued many times during my life, had people come to my rescue. I've been the one on the side of the road without gas so many times, I hate to admit it, and I need to pay attention to that E and the little flash in the light, you see what I'm saying? But above all, we've been rescued from our sin, from our depravity. We're all in for Jesus. If you are a Christian, not only are you eternally going to heaven based on what Christ did in rescuing you and protecting you from yourself, you, your whole life is invested in the truth of the gospel. We preachers, our job is to preach the gospel. But all of us as Christians are really all in for the gospel. It also means, in a secondary meaning, to suck or as in to nurse a baby. We are absolutely dependent on God. And so therefore, we absolutely ought to praise Him with our whole heart, even in the midst of the times when it seems like we are in deep trouble. The doxology, you remember the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We normally sing that every time that we take the Lord's Supper, and we sing it other times as well. But the doxology was written in the year 1666 by a man named Thomas Ken in the midst of plague in Great Britain, in the midst of the Great London Fire of 1860 or 16. 66, in the midst of all that trouble, in the midst of what seemed to be just all kinds of problems, plague, and on top of that, the whole city of London almost burned to the ground. In the middle of that, Thomas Ken said, no, 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 no. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Folks, in the midst of the times when it seems like our whole life is imploding, in the times when it seems like our whole life is shot, and we say, oh God, what am I going to do? God says, you're not going to do anything, child. I'll protect you. Man, isn't that good to hear? It takes a little humility, but it's great to hear. The Bible says here also, though, that joyful praise is just a great thing. He, he says it's something to get excited about. Again, the Hebrew word, I'm not a great Hebrew scholar, but the Hebrew word here, Allah, is, is something that means it's so excited that you have to express your excitement. The, the Strong's Concordance translates it to jump for joy. Interesting. Isn't it? And that's exactly what David's saying. He says that there comes a life, a time in my life, that I am so inclined to praise you, Lord God, that I can't hold it back. Folks, we as Baptists, and this isn't all bad. We as Baptists are a staid group. You are a part, in case you don't know this, 
in case you care, so I'm going to tell you anyway, right? You are a part of the English Baptist tradition. Baptist history had the Sandy Creek tradition in the English Baptist tradition. The Pentecostals took over the Sandy Creek bunch and went crazy with it. And sometimes fake stuff. That's just the truth. But we took the English stayed reserved position. And Southern Baptists are firmly more nearly in that category. And that's not, that's not bad. But folks, there are times when you encounter the living God when you encounter the reality of your protector, that you just got to say, I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Goodness, go ahead. Amen. You know? Paul, or Paul, David says, there's times I just got to jump for joy. We struggle. Some of us struggle. You have those financial troubles. If, if the prize patrol walks up to your front door, It's the Publisher's Clearinghouse. <laughs> and you just won $5,000 a week for the rest of your life. How many? You, you, you be straight with me. I'll be straight with you. How many of you are going to say, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> you ain't neither going to do that. Those of you that do not yet know how to moonwalk will learn on your front porch. You're going to say, praise God. Woo! You are. And there are times that God gets to us. And we got to make a little noise. Now, folks, I'm still a coat and tie preacher. Some of these jerks are... are oh. <laughs> Some of these fellas are wearing their Hawaiian t-shirt to preach the gospel. I ain't into that. I'm into God's control, reserved, exegetical, biblically researched sermons. There ain't no fluff and sissiness. Folks, sometimes even a black, shiny shoe, tie-wearing preacher, the gospel gets to you. The protection of God gets to you. And you just got to get a little bit happy thing. Amen. And folks, what Paul, I keep calling him Paul. David is saying here, I need to preach out of the Old Testament more, don't I? <laughs> David is saying here, sometimes that happens to me. We get excited sometimes. I may or may not have shared this story, but my son's senior year, football. Earlier in the year, a rival team had beaten them 70 to nothing. That hurts. It is the playoffs, and the playoffs in Missouri sometimes happen on Wednesday nights. That's not God's will for the playoffs. I've got to do Wednesday night services. But after Wednesday night services, I said to the people, I'm headed to the game 15 miles away. This other school is about 15 miles away or so. I'm headed to the game. And one of my men said, there's no use. I don't remember his exact words. The gist of it was, ain't no use. They're just going to get whipped again. But I turned the radio on. And as I got closer and closer to the stadium, our boys were holding in there. And as I got into the stadium, I sat down by a close friend who was also a fan of the football team. And we didn't quite win, but we got very close to the greatest upset in district history. Folks, I made an idiot out of myself in the stands. <laughs> it's your son's senior year, and they're about to whip those young men who are so cocky and arrogant and think nobody can take them. But our boys nearly did, folks. I made a, a moron out of myself in this thing. <laughs> this stayed reserved, I did. So much so that my close friend that I sat by scooted over several <laughs> seats. I mean, I don't blame him. But I couldn't hold it back. Folks, I'm not telling you that there's a time in our praise to put on a show. That others are looking and I'm in a fake like I'm filled with more joy than I am. There's nothing more disingenuous. There's nothing more inauthentic than that. But if God gets a hold of your heart, and He sometimes does, there's going to come a time when we just have to praise and celebrate. And sometimes it's 100% appropriate. Christian joy. I wrote this, I think, a few years ago or stole it from somebody else. I couldn't tell, so we'll say I wrote it, right? Christian joy is in your face to the devil 
when suffering comes in to our lives. I think that's true. It's, it's when the devil says, I have got you down, I have got you whipped, I have got you discouraged, I have got you depressed, and, and we say, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sad, oh Lord, what am I going to do? And then we look up and we see His protection and grace, and we get all excited, and we say, I defy you, Satan! Amen. You lying! You know what you are. You are a liar, devil! I'm not depressed, I'm not sad, and I'm not whipped. I am a blood-bought child of God. Amen. Take that, you red devil, and you know where you're going. <laughs> Folks, it's not right to tell anybody on this earth to go to hell, but that's what you can tell the devil, isn't it? That's, right. that's where he's headed. He doesn't have any other option. He can't get saved. It's appropriate to absolutely get in his face. It's not appropriate to get in other people's faces. Back to the football analogy. I repent of this, but I hollered real loud, something along the line, because we were at their home stadium. You kids, you people from blank, blank city, I won't say. <laughs> it's not that far from here. You think you're something, but we about, we about to show you something. That wasn't right. That wasn't decorum. But you can tell the devil where to stick it. Because he's the devil. And because Jesus Christ is Lord and he's your king and he has won. If there ain't anything to get excited about about that, you can't get excited about anything. Also, though, David says here, the joy of praise makes you want to sing. You know what you sing about? What you think neat. When we were first married, we made up a song about our love. And don't <laughs> relax, I'm, I'm going to, I'll spare you. <laughs> but it meant a lot to us, and it kind of sounded like Elvis, we thought. I don't know. <laughs> but joy makes you want to sing, doesn't it? People sing, you know, some people sing about beer joints and sick stuff. A lot of music's just depressing. People sing about killing cops, we hear about that. What in the world? But Christians want to sing about the joy of God. And, and our hymns ought not be rote things. Just, oh, this is number blah, blah, blah in the hymnal, I will sing along. Hear the words of great hymns. Celebrate the truth of great hymns. And the Christian wants to sing. Now, you may not be able technically to sing well. I certainly can't. But that doesn't matter. If there's a song in your heart, that song is going to bubble forth to the glory of God. And I would submit to you, not being in any way an authority on music, I'm just not, but I believe that the great and enduring hymns of Christian history have not necessarily been the ones with the best musical arrangement or, or complex structure. They've been those hymns that spoke the simple truth of God in a way that impacted our lives. Perhaps, for example, one of, the most, one of the most enduring hymns, if not the most enduring hymn of the English-speaking church is the great psalm by John Newton, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That expresses it all for all of us, doesn't it? The great song, Amazing Grace. The old rugged cross. That is the song of the people of God. The world may be singing a different tune. One of the most interesting things that I do know about music, and it's a short list, so I'm going to pretty much exhaust it at this time. But did you know that the great hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, is the exact same tune, or almost the exact same tune, as the secular song, House of the Rising Sun. Have you ever thought about that? While God's people are singing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The world may be singing, there is a house in New Orleans they call the rising sun. Folks, I don't know a lot about that, but I don't think that was a good house in New Orleans. But that's what the, that's what the lost world celebrates. But we celebrate the amazing grace of God. The same tune with a different heart. Folks, do you want to sing and shout the praises of the God whose enduring protection has given you hope? 
This morning you may have come here, you're sad and you're melancholy, you feel like life's kicked you in the teeth a little bit, but we remember God says that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I'm, I don't believe I'm here this morning to tell you, because if I did, I'd be a hypocrite, that every day of our lives as Christians, we're just going around like Pollyanna, smiling and bouncing. No, there are days that we're legitimately depressed. And there's days that all of us are sad. And there is a time, as Solomon said, a time to weep and a time to laugh. Right. I know that's true. Jesus didn't go around in one mood. He wept. At Lazarus' grave. And he said of Jerusalem, Oh, how I would have gathered you like a chicken gathers her babies under her wings, but you wouldn't do it. Man, there's a time for we as Christians to deal with that reality, and life's that way. But the final analysis, the end game for the people of God is to look up and start getting excited. Look up and know we're not alone, that we're the protected Love, joy-filled, just about to bust out in some kind of God song. People that defy the devil in the midst of a broken, real, and sad world. Father, we praise you for your precious word. We praise you. I pray if anyone's here this morning that's not yet come to Christ, that they'll come to the one that can give them protection, salvation, grace. And that for all of us as Christians, that we'll look up and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.